Hello, everybody. We're going to wait until more people pop in and then we'll get started. So in about another uh, minute, but you can see uh, Robert Sapolsky with birds in the background and I'm Ken <laughs> from, from Brooklyn. But I see we already have 68 people, 72. Once the numbers seem to stop uh, or get slowed down. Once we uh, reach a minion. Yeah, well, we have, we have, a, have, have a minion times nine about at the moment. Great. Yep. So let me, let me start, and uh, as others will join, they, you know, they'll miss what, a little bit I have to say, which is totally un. Nar, it's our second one, and uh, we're delighted to have you uh, with us. And I'm particularly delighted to have Robert Sapolsky with us uh, today. Um, Robert's somebody whose work I've admired for a long time, and particularly relevant to the issues of hate. One of the things we're trying to do at the Bard Center for the Study of Hate is really hate from in basic ways to think about it is what does our brain have to do with the hate. Uh, other things, hate groups, hate crimes and so forth, but just getting down to the fact that we're human beings and what does our brain tell us about uh, hatred is to me a central question. So let me read you a little bit about Robert's uh, biography and then I will turn it over to him. Uh, he is the John and A. Cynthia Fry Gunn Professor of Biology, Neurology, and Neurosurgery at Stanford University and a research associate at the Institute for Primate Research in Kenya. His research over the years has been split between neuroscience work in the lab and endocrine research with the population of wild baboons in Africa. And his book, which is uh, something I would recommend you all read, and uh, it's a thick book, but it's a great book, called Behave, um, and, and it really is an eye-opener into the, a lot of the questions that uh, perplex all of us. Uh, I'll say one other thing about Robert, too, from a biography that I saw online. He grew up, as I did, in Brooklyn, um, and he used to spend a lot of time at the Museum of Natural History, which was one of my favorite places. But one of the differences between us is that place inspired Robert to think about what he was seeing there and how animals work and a lot of his, his lifetime passion. For me, it was simply that my father would always say, let's go to the Bronx Zoo. And I said, let's go to the Museum of Natural History. It was a zoo that didn't smell. So that was about as deep as I went into that. I didn't get the odors that I would get if I went to the Bronx Zoo, but I'm glad you got so much more out of the Natural History Museum and I'm delighted you're with us. And I will uh, let you share your wisdom with us. And then what we'll do at the end is that we will take questions, which I will uh, then ask Robert. So for the, now I'm gonna stop my video. You'll see Robert and at the end of uh, his comments, we'll take questions and answers. So thank you, Robert. Good, well, thank you, Ken. I, I should note that given the neighborhood I grew up in Brooklyn, what I was mostly going to the Museum of Natural History for was looking at the African dioramas there and wishing to live inside one. So it's very nice that that finally happened. Well, thank you for tuning in or whatever this is. I will admit this to being my first webinar. Um, and this all seems very odd. Um, also apologies, there seems to be some construction somewhere in the background. Also for the moment, a almost sleeping dog who I certainly hope is not going to get riled up, but apologies if he does and I will try to keep him contained. Um, so to begin, um, if you study the biological basis of behavior, if you've spent part of your time thinking about humans, part of your time thinking about baboons, what you're stuck with after a while is trying to keep track of, so what are the things that humans do which turn out to be utterly unique? And what are the ones that turn out just to be on a continuum with other species? And an awful lot of primatology, comparative psych, zoology, so on, in recent decades has consisted of saying, 
ah, what used to be thought of as uniquely human turns out not to be anymore. Some of this has been awful. We are not the only species that kills, not by a long shot. We're not the only one that kills in an organized, premeditated fashion. Chimps, all the males in a group of chimps will form a border patrol at the edge of their territory. And if they encounter a male from another group, they will kill him. They are capable of making something resembling weapons, another universal uniqueness about humans that went down the tubes. And most remarkably, if you follow the United Nations definition of genocide, which is attempting to systematically eliminate all the members of a group, not because who the people are, but simply because of their group membership, chimps have committed genocide, killing all the males in the neighboring group and expanding their territories. So we are not alone in that regard. Fortunately, we're not alone in some good things as well. We're on a continuum when it comes to indices of empathy, of a sense of justice, of what is called theory of mind, of understanding that another individual has different thoughts, different knowledge, different feelings than you have. So all sorts of ways in which we are just another primate made up of a bunch of neurons like any other there with some, you know, vaguely interesting qualities, but nonetheless still on a continuum. What I want to talk about today is one domain where nonetheless we are absolutely unique. And that turns out to be one that requires a for better and for worse, which is our capacity to think symbolically, to think in metaphors, to understand when somebody else is doing so and proving with that sentence, when we are understanding the concept of metaphors, we are not literally standing under the metaphor. We are a symbolic species. And the first evidence for that is tens of thousands of years old cave paintings, artists at the time attempting to metaphorically capture the essence of whatever animal they were painting. We are a symbolic species. And what's most interesting about that and our capacity to think symbolically, to think metaphorically, is our brains are not very good at it when you look at how they work. And this turns out to do something very interesting in that amid all the sophistication of our brains and, and metaphors and, and aphorisms and parables and all that sort of stuff, our brains are actually very, very crude and primitive in handling metaphor with some interesting consequences. Let me start off with an example, which is a part of the brain called the insula, the insular cortex. For 99% of beasts out there, the insula has a basic task, which is you're a rat and you bite into some food that is rotten, toxic, fetid, and in a tenth of a second, the insula activates, and as a result, it triggers all sorts of reflexes. The rat spits out the food, it gags, it, maybe it throws up. What does the insula cortex do? It, it protects you from toxic foods. It detects gustatory disgust. And it certainly works that way in us, get some unlikely psych 101 volunteer to get into a brain scanner and bite into some disgusting rotten piece of food and their insular cortex will activate in a tenth of a second. But then we could do something much more sophisticated, which is have this person with a brain scanner, they don't bite into something disgusting. You just make them think about doing so. Show them pictures of people eating insects and things of that sort, and there's a good chance their insula will activate also. Aha, we are sophisticated enough to not just have it activate for gustatory disgust, but for imagining gustatory disgust. But then you do something far, far more interesting in displaying what our brains do. Put that person in the scanner. They don't eat disgusting food. You don't make them contemplate eating disgusting food. And instead, you show them a picture of a swastika. You show them a picture of people in KKK clothes burning across. You show them any indices of hate and there's a chance their insular cortex will activate at that point just as surely as if they have bitten into rotten food. And by the time you get to humans, the insular cortex also does moral disgust. 
And that is extraordinary. You look at a single neuron in the insula and you cannot tell if that person has just bitten into rancid food or is just contemplating the worst of human behaviors and felt disgusted as a result. And this explains why when we contemplate things that are sufficiently morally disgusting, we feel sick to our stomachs. We want to puke. We feel queasy. We're left with a bad taste in our mouths. And what we see here is a bit of the primitiveness of the human brain. Moral disgust, I don't know, is 20,000 years old, 40,000 years old, a blink of the eye since we sort of formalized that. The insular cortex is probably about 70 million years old. So when humans came up with moral disgust, we didn't have some big old committee meeting where people had to decide whether to like invent a new part of the brain or not. They had to tinker. They had to improvise with some duct tape and they said, ha, huh, moral disgust, insula, it does food disgust. I don't know. That kind of sounds the same. So expand its portfolio. And from now on, the insula also does moral disgust. It is metaphorically very primitive. When we are disgusted by somebody's moral act, it is not literally us having a response to rid ourselves of toxins that can wind up in our gastrointestinal tract. But nonetheless, our brain does not understand that moral disgust is a metaphor. It reacts just as strongly as if it were rotten food. And this could be a great thing uh, because sometimes if you want to right a wrong, it's not just an abstract proposition. It's something where you need a fire in your belly, where you need viscera to make you take on this harder task of trying to right that wrong. So there's a good side to it. There's a bad side, of course. As soon as people decide that a sense of disgust is their litmus test for what counts as good or bad, because what that sets you up for is deciding that them and their different ways of looking or eating or praying or loving is disgusting and thus is wrong, wrong, wrong. But the main point here is like a neuron in the insular cortex in the most advanced brain there is on this planet, nonetheless can't tell, ah, that's just a metaphor. Other examples, another part of the brain called the anterior cingulate. And what it does is it tells you something if you're feeling pain, somebody has poked your finger with a pin, and it tells you about the context for that pain. Is this terrifying? Is this an accident? Is this mildly unpleasant? Is this disastrous? Whatever. It does interpretive perceptual stuff about pain. But now take somebody and instead, instead of poking their finger with a pin, have them watch the finger of their loved one be poked with a pin and their anterior cingulate will activate. It's the part of the brain where you feel somebody else's pain. And again, a neuron in the anterior cingulate, by looking at its patterns of action potentials, cannot tell the difference between your pain and someone else's. And not surprisingly, studies have shown all sorts of depressing stuff. Show people a film clip, people in a brain scanner, a film clip of a hand being poked with a needle. And as the needle goes in, the anterior cingulate will activate. But in the average person, if the skin color of that hand is different from your own, the anterior cingulate doesn't activate as much. It all depends on whose pain it is. So we have another part of the brain here, which whenever we came up with feeling somebody else's pain, they improvised, they tinkered as a famous quote, evolution is not about inventing, it's about tinkering. And here's a part of the brain that's not very good at recognizing responding to somebody else's pain as hurting you is just a metaphor. It can't tell the difference. And we see examples of this over and over. Another one, a finding that's like one of my favorites, take people, have them fill out a questionnaire about their political views, their social politics, their geopolitical, their economic. And if they're sitting in a room that smells of rotten garbage, people become more socially conservative. It does nothing to their economic views, nothing to their geopolitics, but they're much more likely to decide that when those people are doing something that is very, very different, it's also disgusting and it's wrong, wrong, wrong. 
And here we have visceral disgust as a stepping stone for like, not only is it disgusting when they slather themselves with whatever ointments they do or eat whatever we view as being some forbidden animal, but their notion about the afterlife is disgusting as well. And neurons there cannot tell the difference between a disgusting smell and a disgusting lifestyle. More examples. Here's another amazing study, and this actually came from the same group that did the smell stuff, the group at Yale. Okay, take somebody and they believe they are on their way to go do a psych experiment and that they volunteered for. I got to fill out some puzzles or who knows what. Psych department's up on the third floor. They get in the elevator and they're on their way up. And as they get in the elevator, somebody else gets in with them. And the somebody else is someone actually working on the study. And this is where the experiment is carried out. The person who jumps in, the stranger, is holding a cup of coffee and a whole bunch of books and folders that they're about to drop. And they say, oh, can you do me a favor? Can you hold the coffee for a second while I, while I get this together? And the subject, the volunteer, does that and gives it back to them at the end, thanks, and gets out at the next floor. And now the volunteer gets out and goes into the psych lab where they are asked, ah, you just met somebody in the elevator there. Tell me about that person. How would you rate them on a scale of this to this for this attribute, for that attribute? And among other things, you are asked, how warm or cold did you think that person's personality was? And as it turns out, half the time, that cup of coffee was a warm cup of coffee. Half the time, it was iced coffee. And now that volunteer has held a warm cup or a cold cup for 15 seconds and hold the warm cup. And you're more likely now to rate the person as having a warm personality, iced coffee, cold personality. This is crazy. You look at the parts of your brain that do thermoregulation and tell something about temperature information. And, you know, it's the exact same wiring as you would find in a cold-blooded lizard sort of thing. Yet, somehow, it also plays a role in this metaphorical task of us thinking about personality and friendliness of it as being described on some sort of temperature continuum. It's totally bizarre. And there's just more and more cases of that. Here's one that begins to be particularly relevant. Sit somebody down and have them read a passage, some scary passage about emerging novel diseases that are about to sweep over the world. And as we know, a recently emerged zoonotic virus is doing the exact thing to us. Basically a scary passage about there's all sorts of infections that are possibly threatening us and our safety. And if you've just read that, people in the aftermath are more hostile towards immigration into the United States, legal or illegal. The, th the threat of an invasion, a pathogenic invasion, is subliminally weighing on you. And this comes in, in all sorts of other ways where we see over and over, no, no, that is not actually a pathogenic invasion. You were applying that concept to other human beings. The brain has real trouble with metaphors. And it's, again, simply because the brain improvises when you come up with something new. You've had 100 million years of thermoregulatory neural circuitry, and I don't know how many thousands of years of deciding people could have cold or warm personalities. Our brain is just winging it, just improvising when it comes to thinking symbolically or thinking metaphorically for better and for worse. And now is the place to begin to explore where some of that for worse comes from. And this is a bit of sort of neurobiological insight that um, every demagogue, every murderous dictator has understood intuitively, which is if you want to get people on your side to just be leaping out of their seats to take it out on thems, some out with them, some underdog them, some such thing, the way to do it is to make your followers disgusted by them. And the way to make them disgusted is to implicitly, unconsciously, subliminally, over and over associate those thems with something disgusting. 
The Nazis understood this perfectly well. Their propaganda, their posters were full of endless imagery of Jews and Roma as rats, as rodents that needed to be eradicated. Europe right now and some of its white nationalist sort of hostility, Islamophobia, Islam is always viewed as a malignancy in Western culture, a cancer growing amid Christian civilization. Foreigners are vermin invading our shores. Donald Trump himself referred to immigrants coming to this country as an invasion, an invasion with the same words as for a zoonotic virus. We see other examples of this as well. We see during the Rwandan genocide when the Hutu tribal population, their community, led to a genocide that eradicated 75-80% of the Tutsis living there over the course of 100 days or so. And in the months leading up to the genocide, the Hutu chauvinist radio stations blasted over and over and over. Those Tutsis are going to rape your wives. Those Tutsis are going to steal your daughters. Those Tutsis, and as prescribed, by the people running the planned genocide, the Tutsis were never called Tutsis. They were called cockroaches over and over and over. And then we see the same with those posters that pop up in various right-wing places here. If it's brown, flush it down with the face of somebody Latino, the evocation there being those people as shit those people as pathogens, those people as things to fear and exclude. So what we see here again and again is if you want to do something right and pull off your genocide effectively, take advantage of the limitations of our brains and the fact that if you want to evoke hatred of thems, what you do is get the insular cortex activated with disgust or get your reptilian hypothalamic brain viewing them as being cold and clannish or any of these things and suddenly you have the viscera going get those parts of the brain activating the right way in your followers and you've checked off most of the things on your to-do list to pull off an effective genocide and one of the things that you also see is wonderful work by somebody named Susan Fisk at Princeton has shown that them, they's are not all the same. They come in different categories. There are them's, they's outgroup members who you pity. There are those who simply disgust you. The homeless put people in a brain scanner and flash up pictures of homeless and drug addicts and the insular cortex typically activates. Put people and flash up pictures of outgroup members who scare you rather than just seem disgusting, a part of the brain called the amygdala having to do with fear and aggression activates. But then there are the thems who evoke envy and you know, distrust and desire to have their resources. And what you see over and over historically is when the mob comes for them, the first thing you do is degrade them, humiliate them, turn them from the envied powerful minority group who you wish to be and turn them into degraded. When the Nazis came for the Jews, they forced them to scrub the sidewalks with their toothbrushes in front of mocking crowds and shave their beards in front of them. When Idi Amin had the Asians, the Indo-Pakistanis, who were the middle class there, had them stripped of their citizenship and thrown out of the country, he invited his soldiers to come and beat and terrorize and rape them first over and over, the way to make them seem like they hardly even count as a human is to get you to the point where their travails just disgust you. And what you see here, sort of beginning to round up with this, is this is another feature of humans that is a uniqueness of us. Species after species out there, you look at the evolution of social behavior, and it is built around something called kin selection. Animals behave in order to pass on copies of their genes, and they will often do so by helping their close relatives pass on copies of their genes, famously summarized as, I'll lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. 
And what you see is animal social behaviors endlessly organized along lines of kinship, cooperation among kin, turning on outsiders, that sort of stuff. How does a lab rat or a hamster know who is a full sibling, who is a half sibling, who's a fourth cousin, who's a complete stranger? They're able to do it instinctually. Pheromonal signatures that carry identification and relatedness. They do it automatically. Humans don't. We have to think about it. And what that allows us to be is manipulated. Some of the time we can manipulate it into feeling like somebody is more related to us than we actually are. Pseudo kinship. That could be a wonderful thing. That could be the means by which you will press a button on a computer and donate money to somebody on the other side of the planet whose face you will never see because something about them evokes a sense of closest to you. Every military on earth for centuries of the highest tech to the most sort of, you know, traditional understand pseudo kinship. Take those military recruits and make them feel like they are a band of brothers and they are willing to give up their lives for each other. And at the same time, the flip side of it is pseudo speciation and make them seem so different and so far and so unhuman that it hardly even counts when you kill them. And what we see is we have a brain which amid all its fanciness is predisposed to being exploited in precisely those ways and our metaphorical hands of our brains are covered in blood as a result of that. So why don't I stop at this point and see if there's any questions. Great. Well, thank you so much for that, Robert. That was uh, both inspiring and disturbing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. but you know that. So let me ask a question. I, I see that some questions queuing up. So let me um, just ask you one and then I'll get to the others. So, you know, if you were advising either a non-government organization that deals with either hatred writ large or some aspect of hatred, um, hate crimes, vilification, whatever, or a political party that was pushing back against a lot of the xenophobia that we see as playing for the, all the reasons you were you know, articulated so easily and so well and so disturbingly. If their strategies were to be informed by your science as opposed to we're just going to do dossiers or we're going to do talking points or whatever, but if it started at the granular level of what can we say, what can we organize, what can we think about taking as the first step, this is how human beings are going to react, how their brains are going to work, how do we make it so that you know, they're less likely to go down the road of, of vilification and genocide and more in terms of what you're talking about, the pseudo kinship. Uh, so the large what, question about. A, a number of first prescriptions. Um, the first one is sort of comes in what's a sound bite for me by now you can't reason somebody out of a stance they weren't reasoned into in the first place. And amid people being willing to go on about why they are awful because of their economics or their belief system or what they did to your people in the battle of somewhere in 1623 or some such thing, um, the core of it is sheer viscera, sheer emotion, sheer fear, sheer anxiety, sheer tendency to be unsettled by novelty rather than intrigued by it. Every bit of science shows that you put someone again in a brain scanner and you ask them to make a moral decision about somebody else's actions and the emotional parts of the brain will activate before the cortical parts do and the responses of the emotional parts will be more predicted to their decision than the cortical parts. A lot of the time, what we view as our rational judgments of other people are instead post hoc rationalizations rushing there to make sense so that we don't have to embarrass ourselves by saying, I can't tell you why, but it's so, so wrong when those people do that. Ah, here's why it's so, so wrong. Sort of coupled with that, I think what you wind up seeing then is you're not going to get people to like live at peace with each other by solely approaching the rational, you know, instrumental utilitarian aspects of their disagreements. Like 
it's wonderful that, say, Jordan and Israel signed a peace treaty back when, and they figured out how they were going to share water from the Jordan River. Great. That was a great way of causing hostilities to cease. A great way for making peace, though, was when the king of Jordan came to the funeral of Yitzhak Rabin after he was assassinated for being a peacemaker by one of his own alt-right fanatics. Like, the sight of the king of Jordan there mourning with the rest, that's how you build peace rather than just stopping war. And what's implicit in that is the work of people like Robert Axelrod and Scott Atran on things like sacred values. Things where not only are people willing to like die for them and kill for them, but your attempts to pay them to view that in a different standpoint are viewed as insulting and offensive. And because what those are doing is talking to your gut, talking to your metaphorical gut, talking to your insular cortex and the parts of your brain that are sacred. If you get to the point where you were willing to protest because they're ruining your economy, you're going to get to the point where you're willing to die in the terrorist act if you feel like they are disrespecting your most sacred values. And that's like back to the metaphorical brain again. Thank you. So let me get to, so I'm going to turn off my video. You're just the, the only person seen there. And I'm going to ask you some of the questions. We have a whole bunch lined up. Um, so a law professor said, primates have conceptions of justice. What do you mean by that? Great. This was obviously very far from our sense of it. And it's very nice to hear a legalistic person wondering about this. This was work done by Franz Duval incredibly important creative primatologist at Emory University. Here's the setup. You've got two monkeys, two rhesus monkeys in cages, and each of them have mastered the same task. They're side by side. They have both learned if you press a lever, you get a reward, a slice of cucumber, which is sort of pleasing for a monkey. So they're going along and suddenly you introduce socioeconomic inequality, you introduce injustice into their goings on. The two of them are pressing the levers. The first one completes his task. He gets a slice of cucumber. The second one completes his task and he gets something amazing, something wonderful, like a raisin or a grape that is so much better than some stupid slice of cucumber. What you will see the majority of the time is the guy who's getting the cucumber, who's getting paid at the exact same rate that he used to be, will now refuse to press the lever or fling the cucumber back at the poor grad student studying this. What is most interesting is in a subset of the individuals getting the grapes or the raisins, they will refuse the food as well and fling it back. It's a tiny subset, but whatever's going on in those minds of those guys is they are capable of stepping past yeah, wow, great, that's so much better than cucumber, and saying that's not right. Rudimentary, obviously a world away from our refined sense of justice and all the layers of moral development in children, but nonetheless, something that is shockingly familiar. Right, thank you. So another, another question, are thoughts and feelings the same thing? Ah, okay. This, this one keeps thousands of brain scientists gainfully employed. Um, are thoughts and feelings the same? What we come back to is like what is officially designated as one of the most set in stone false dichotomies, the difference between cognition and emotion, thoughts and feelings. Descartes famously dichotomized them. Uh, Antonio Damasio, wonderful neurologist, writer, and a famous book of his, um, Descartes' Error, looking at the ways in which they are absolutely inseparable. The parts of the brain that are supposedly just about thought, your cortex, and the parts about emotion, the limbic system, are sending so many projections to each other. Every time you can think of something that happened in your past, an emotionally arousing circumstance, and your heart beats faster, you've just proved that they're not separable. Every time you're in an emotionally aroused state and you make some god-awful, stupid, impulsive decision because your limbic system is overwhelming your cortex, you're showing they are not separable. 
And what's often the case, especially you, if, if you have a Mr. Spock sort of tint to your values, there's the view that, oh, if only we can get emotions out of our moral decision making, out of our decision making in general, we'd be so rational and this would be so much better of a world and it would be so much of a disaster because so much of the time when we are doing the right thing, when it's the harder thing to do, we're not being driven by rational conclusions. Any sort of cost benefit analysis at that point would tell you you'd be crazy to run into that burning building to ch save the life of the perfect stranger. It's emotions that are making you do this. And when you look at individuals who have brain damage of a type where their frontal cortex cannot get emotional input into decision making, these are people who are horrifying utilitarian horrifyingly willing to sacrifice any one person for five, including their loved ones. Not only are we in, you know, intricately intertwined between emotion and cognition, it's a great thing we are because without either of them, when they're destroyed by brain damage, we have versions of dysfunction that are catastrophic. Great, thank you. So I have two questions here that are, I guess, are related to what I was asking about knowing this. So what can we do to make the world a little bit of a better place, knowing how the brains work? So these two uh, are, one is, what do you see as the role of education? Can education overcome these responses? And the other is, how do we start teaching training? Sorry, that... that blocked out. How do we start teaching? Uh, uh, training for positive emotional responses. Good. All right. Well, uh, as, as a parent, I've certainly thought about this and bemoaned sort of not having enough good intuitions about this and education. Um, you know, one of the things that probably help is teaching people social and emotional learning and recognizing others' pain and, you know, all sorts of obvious stuff like that. Um, in an ironic sort of way, what the studies show, studies about things like contact theory, what they show is it may be wonderful to be in a classroom that can teach students about diversity and pluralism and isn't another viewpoint wonderful and stimulating rather than anxiety provoking all of that. You want to do it even better, have the classroom be diverse and pluralistic and have the differences become the norm, have the differences become a novel version of us's. And a great way sort of seeing that is like one of the most depressing findings there is in this whole literature. You take people, put them in a brain scanner, flash up faces at like a quarter of a second. And with each face, there's a part of the cortex that processes faces, it lights up. And then your average person flash up the face of someone of a different race. And instead there's activation of the amygdala, fear, anxiety, aggression in under one tenth of a second. My God, this is the most depressing thing you've ever seen. But then listen to what I had just said in your average person, that's what happens. Who are the exceptions? And it's people who grew up in racially diverse neighborhoods. Their categories of who is an us and who is a them isn't interested in skin color. Almost certainly they've got us them dichotomies as surely as anybody else does, but maybe their dichotomy is built around nice people and rotten people, and maybe that's where their divide is. Early experience, sustained, sustained exposure to thems turned them into us's. Amid that, and this is decades worth of sort of contact theory psychology saying this, it is a narrow window of parameters that, re that are required for it to actually work that way. And do it wrong, not only don't thems become us's, you hate the thems even more afterward. It is a very sort of tightrope circumstance to pull it off and education is one of the domains where for better or worse, it has a big impact how that sort of thing is done. Thank you. And next question is, Michael Bang Peterson has shown a correlation between high disgust sensitivity and right-wing authoritarianism, which is clearly worrying amidst the pandemic for those seeking to counter violent extremism. 
Can you comment on how this might be linked to the insular cortex? And can you suggest why uh, Rotarianism has been shown to be linked to conspiracism? It's, it's, I love that research. It's like perfect. You look at people and for example, in these studies, you show people disgusting things like pictures of gaping wounds with maggots or things of that sort. And you can measure all sorts of visceral disgust responses, how much their stomach lurches, how much their salivary rate changes. You know, you can, you can do science on it and measure disgust. And what you see is on the average, people with lower thresholds for visceral autonomic disgust tend to be more right wing than people who have a higher threshold. And this turns out to fit perfectly with this whole world of how do you make you know, your moral judgments? It's the wisdom of repugnance. If it makes you puke, you must rebuke. If what they do is so different that you decide it's disgusting, that's a prescription for someone who is intolerant, someone who is authoritarian, someone who all those things, and that comes through in the most fascinating ways. You look at political conservatives and you look at political progressives and the former on the average have more cleaning products in their home. Absolutely. You look at people and you have them read something about some morally disgusting whatever that taps into their realm of moral disgust and people who are political conservatives are more likely to wash their hands afterward than are political progressives. What this speaks to is that metaphorical stuff, a bad taste in my mouth, blood on my hands, whatever, that metaphorical stuff people are very rarely reaching their hatreds out of some sort of rationality. They're reaching their hatreds out of fear and out of displacement and out of their history of their own sufferings and all of that. And it is visceral and it is emotional and it is there, you know, hundreds of milliseconds before your conscious rational cortex begins the job of figuring out why that visceral hatred actually makes perfect sense. And that fits perfectly with these pictures of, of authoritarianism and why it's so easy to make people like that decide that those thems are vermin and rodents and malignancies and feces. Another question is, what about the lessons of the robber's cave experiment? get antagonists to work together on a common problem. Yeah, this was, this was one of the starting sort of observations in this whole sort of school of contact theory psychology. If you bring people together from two different groups and Robbers Cave is what spawns, I don't know, decades of these like really heartwarming summer camps bringing Northern Irish Catholics and Protestants together in a teenagers in a summer camp or Palestinians and Israelis and all premised on this notion that a spend a bunch of time together and you begin to see more of the similarities and the differences B the best way to do that is with a common goal and some of these summer camps have done things like take these newly arrived Israeli and Palestinian kids and say you see that totally overgrown field full of rocks and boulders and stuff you guys, if you want to have a soccer field, you need to spend the next week clearing it out. And everyone does it. And afterward, they have a sense of usness and there's kinship. And we're the ones who rolled this boulder out of the way. And it's incredibly heartwarming and makes you hope for the world. And that's exactly the domain where you see, nonetheless, if you don't do it right, you can make things worse. What constitutes making it worse? Doing it on ground that isn't neutral instead in one of the group's place, instead of in a neutral location, doing it where there's very unequal numbers of people from the two groups, doing it where what one group believes they are bringing as a point of their group's pride as a sacred value is viewed as inflammatory by the other group. You can't bring flags, you can't bring decals, you can't bring this or that. And <coughs> only if it goes on for a long, long time. And even under those circumstances, when all of that is done right, 
what you see is nonetheless, the effects are not terribly long lasting. To my knowledge, no graduate of any of those summer programs has become a leader of any peace movement in the Mideast. What I think you most often see is these people come back and they particularize their sudden sense of humanity. They particularize in that they can go on and say, <coughs> those people, those people are terrible. They're awful what they've done to us. They're monsters. They have no feelings. Those oh, I know this one guy though. He's actually a good guy. We hung out one summer, but those people, it doesn't generalize to the rest of the group and it doesn't generalize to other groups very readily. So stuff like that contact theory has a wonderful potential. But again, unless you're doing it under very controlled circumstances and the, commonal the commonality that you're speaking to is the visceral stuff rather than, oh, isn't that interesting? We all have similar historical problems. Unless you speak to the viscera, you're gonna get nowhere. Thank you. So uh, related to some aspects of the robber's cave, but a different question, understandable. How are people taught to quote like symbols such as the swastika cave? You talked in the robber's cave, you know, there was a flag and all that stuff too. But the, well, I guess a larger question is how do symbols impact the whole matter of, of us and them? Uh, let's see. I just missed the last part of this. So how how, yes. How, how does symbols impact the brain. So, the, you know, these symbols, the swastika, you know, the, the, sure. Uh, how, how do they, what happens in the brain when people uh, see those? Why is something that's so powerful? Because they tap into exactly those parts of the brain that have been assigned these very sophisticated tasks in the last 10, 20, 30,000 years and are dealing with 80 million year old circuitry because when you look at the right symbol, you feel terror or disgust or hatred or pride or sadness. And the neurons that are activated at that point are ones that are normally dealing with real things like physical pain or toxic food or something threatening your life right at the moment rather than the abstraction of a economic threat and things of that sort. It's exactly that point of our brains are very primitively dealing with some very sophisticated contexts and concepts. And out the other side comes a great deal of visceral force that can go behind those fears or those hatreds or that pride or that any such thing. I think that's exactly what's going on. Great, thank you. And Next is, can you talk about how morality and identity, specifically belonging, uh, interact in the brain? Is there a neuroscientific explanation for why our morality, no, excuse me, mortality, excuse me, I, I read that wrong. Can you talk about, let me start again. Can you talk about how mortality and identity, specifically belonging, uh, no, it's, I, I, let me try it again. Can you talk about how morality and identity, specifically belonging in the brain, is there a neuroscientific explanation for why our morality is framed through our personal biases and tribal belonging that allow us to skew our moral ethical values based on what is favorable to us over them. Because we're primates. We're, we're parochial in our biases. We have in-group biases that are in place incredibly quickly. Um, and a great example of that, this was work, sort of a, a derivative of Robert's Cave, um, known as a minimal paradigm approach. You take a bunch of people um, and they're lined up there and you say, okay, we're going to form two groups and you flip a coin to determine that and all of the heads wind up there and all of the tails there and people... <coughs> people watched it. They understood this was totally arbitrary, random grouping. And nonetheless, before the end of the day, individuals are showing in-group preference for their coin toss group. They are showing more of a tendency to cooperate with them, more generosity in an economic game, things of that sort. And they can tell you consciously, yes, 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 I know it was random, but really we're great. And those people who came up tails, they eat their dead and they, they, they're awful and all of that. What you wind up seeing is 
amid this rationality, um, we're terribly irrational. And so much of that irrationality is fueled by our consciousness that we're mortal. And thus what we do amid that fear is we cling to our symbols, we cling to our sacred, sacred values, we cling to whatever can make the panic go away for a moment and convince us that we are part of something bigger and longer lasting than ourselves. And what that so easily is, is the group that we belong to. And along with that comes all the baggage of group membership, as usual, for better or worse. If we can sit there and be terrified about mortality, but nonetheless, we share the views of our group that there's life after death, or we're doing something that will leave the planet a better place for our great grandchildren who will never meet, there's comfort there. And implicit in that is a sense of group identity. Another question, uh, what can we do to use moral disgust as a means to engage in anti-racism and confront authoritarianism? Great. Um, this is precisely where the double-edged sword cuts both ways and partially mixing metaphors or whatever. This is where there's the good side to it as well as the downside. Again, it is very rare that we are willing to devote our lives or undergo great sacrifices or maybe even pay the ultimate price to try to right a wrong that is a mere cognitive abstraction for us. What we have to do is get enough viscera to force us, mobilize us, activate us to do these harder things. And in those cases, not disgust at them and how they pray and how they love and how they whatever, but disgust at them and how they damage and how they hate and how they scapegoat and bully. Um, that's, that's the thing that we need to go and do the harder thing because almost always the much easier thing is going to be to look the other way and turn the page and pretend you didn't notice or decide it's too hard for you to take on or decide it's somebody else's problem. And that's the easy out. Unless your stomach is lurching in some literal and or metaphorical way, um, you're not gonna find the fire to go and do this version of doing the harder thing. Are there, another question, are there examples in other species of very different neurological bases for social behavior? Um, that's a great question. Um, just as one example, just to get, well, moral behavior, I don't know, here's, here's, here's an extrapolation, but it's just kind of cool neurobiology. So without question, there are cultures on earth that view polygamy as a moral good and you know, at times in Africa, over my decades there of working, sort of people I'd encounter would say stuff like, wow, is it true in your country, you would put people in jail if you get a second wife? Oh my God, how immoral is that? So there's cultures that view polygamy as moral. There's cultures that view monogamy as moral. So now let's look at, say, a rough equivalent. And yes, work with me here in terms of how rough this is. There are these vole species, there are these little rodent things, and for decades the darlings of people who study one type of brain science and behavior have looked at two species of voles. There's prairie voles, which I guess run around the grasslands of Nebraska, and mountain voles that run around the Rocky Mountains. Prairie voles are monogamous, they mate for life. Mountain voles are polygamous. And people know the neurobiology of this. There's a hormone that male voles release when they're mating called vasopressin. And we human males do the same thing. And vasopressin gets into the brain and binds to vasopressin receptors. And because there's a difference in the genetic regulation of the vasopressin, vasopressin receptor gene in prairie voles and mountain voles, prairie voles have receptors for vasopressin 
on their reward pathway neurons. So that when a male prairie vole mates, his vasopressin stimulates those reward neurons even more than they're stimulated in a mountain vole when mating. And the prairie vole guy says, that was amazing. I think I'll stick around here for the rest of my life. And there has even been one like landmark genetic engineering study where they took that snippet of DNA in the prairie vole version and stuck it into mountain voles and made them no longer polygamous, turned them from that into being monogamous. So on some mechanistic level, and again, this is miles away from moral condemnation of people whose marriage version seems immoral to you. Um, but nonetheless, this is just like a bit of an example of the ways in which we, like those prairie voles, are nothing more or less than our biology. Right. Oh, so we'll take one last Go thing. Ahead. Of, Go ahead. Um, the genetic differences in the stretch of DNA found between prairie voles and mountain voles, it turns out, so what about the human version? Monogamous monkey species have the prairie vole version. South American monkeys like marmosets, polygamous um, monkey species have the mountain vole version. What about humans? We have a version that's about halfway in between with a lot of individual differences and people who have the more polygamous version of that stretch of DNA on the average have shorter marriages, less stable ones, more risky sexual behavior and so on. Not big effects. You can't look at somebody's DNA sequence when you meet them in a single bar and have anything predictive there. But nonetheless, on a statistical level, you know, that plays out in us. It's the same biology. It's a hell of a lot more complex, but it's the same blueprint and same building blocks. All right, thank you. So we'll take a couple more questions, and I know we have a lot of others that we're not going to get to, uh, but I will share them with, uh, with Robert, and maybe we can get back to, to people later. Um, so this, this one is one I get asked a lot, but I'm going to ask it to you a little differently. It says, how uh, can I respond to a friend who makes a racist statement about people of my racial group, but tells me that a statement did not relate to me because I'm different. And what I'll add to that is to think about the response, knowing how the brain works, as opposed to you know uh, the, the general type of you know don't do that and how do you? I mean, knowing the brain, how the brain works, what would you say to somebody like that? Um, maybe even just as a strategic tool saying, oh, no, 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 of course, I know you don't mean that about me. I know that I am your blood brethren or some such, you know, conciliatory crap to sort of make them like listen a little bit, but in the can't reason out of what wasn't reasoned into in the first place, on some level, all you can say is, yeah, 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 I know you didn't mean it about me. I know you're distinguishing, et cetera, et cetera, but that hurts, that hurts, that hurts. That hurts because the very sound of that word hurts. That hurts because I know, even though you don't mean it, all sorts of people out there who say that word would like to see me suffer and would like to play a role in that. That hurts, that hurts, and I thought you were better than that. You know, some version of speaking to the viscera. Thank you, so I'll ask two more questions and we'll wrap up. So uh, one is, so do you think continued segregated education keeps us from evolving to less races and children have skin color as a way of defining them? Why do you think some get past this even though they're growing up in segregated communities? They move past racism. They move past because they're lucky in ways that most people growing up in, in environments that foster you on fear and displacement aggression and scapegoating succumb to. And whether it's because they've got more of this type of receptor in this empathy related part of the brain, maybe because their upbringing caused epigenetic changes in reward pathways so that they had a broader array of what counts as taking pleasure in somebody else's good fortune, you know, this is taking a very mechanistic way of explaining all the environmental influences that go into it, but it's just sheer damn luck. Luck, biological, luck, environmental, those people who are not poisoned by what is on the average circumstances of poisonous upbringings. 
And the last question for today is I'd really like to hear him talk about gender. Hate is certainly in play with high rates of violence against women, but I don't see the same characterization as a repugnant other. Yeah, gender is an interesting category. And Susan Fisk, again, that scientist at Princeton who's done some of this amazing work, sees gender bias, gender hatred as an exception to the general rule that the groups that you hate, the groups that you are biased against are in general groups you don't want to hang out around. Um, and sort of chauvinism, sexual violence, all of that is in a category of individuals who you don't shun, who if anything, often exactly those sorts of people want to have them around on your terms, on your prejudicial terms, on your exploitative terms, on your manipulative terms, and so on. But gender is a different category because it just gets filed away. It brings in parts of the brain with arousal and things like that that make you even screwier in your ability to think rationally. It falls in a different category. They're different from the rodents and the vermin and the malignancies who are the normal thems. It's a different category. And probably what that is about is, you know, racism is only maybe a few thousand, 10,000 years old or so um, that people have encountered anybody of a different race. Gender is one of the deepest us them dichotomies we've got in our brains. You could undo racial automatic categorization in all sorts of ways in a fraction of a second. Gender categorizations are the ones that are toughest to change. Um, so I think it's fundamentally a different category. Right, and, and on that note, I want to thank you, Robert. I really appreciated the, the time. I've loved to one of these days get you physically to bar to meet with students and uh, continue the discussion. One question uh, that I, I will answer that a couple of people have asked, is this going to be available for viewing? Yes, you should each get an email with a link to a recording tomorrow and it'll be archived on the Bard Center for the Study of Hate website site under the tab uh, of webinars. And with that, let me thank Robert again and thank all of you for your time and attention today um, and have a safe and healthy afternoon. And we'll convene again with another program uh, on a different aspect of hate in June. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. All of you. Okay, bye-bye.